There was a moment in 2023 when all eyes in the video game space were on the indie scene, but for all the wrong reasons. In September, Unity announced a highly controversial new pricing model that raised an immediate backlash from small developers and their supporters. Now, Unity has since partially walked this back, but the memory still lingers. In the words of Deadlink developer Jegor Smihalak, Recent industry controversies have sent ripples throughout the community, affecting decisions made by both small and large developers. Today, most games are closely tied to the game engines, and devs choose not to build their own from scratch. Therefore, we find ourselves somewhat dependent on the decisions made by our chosen engine providers. There is now an understanding that the industry can change in ways that can profoundly affect small developers. Aspiring developers began researching alternative engines while existing teams recalculated their budgets, but everybody felt that the scene was going to change. Unity aside, 2023 was a pretty good year for indie games overall. There were quite a few significant games that cleared the million unit mark, even without any of the big time releases that draw the attention of the gaming press. And smaller games now make up a larger proportion of the overall market than they did a few years ago when I wrote the first State of Indie article. Nevertheless, these games, of which there are more being released than ever, are still just a tiny sliver of the whole industry, lost in the long shadows cast by AAA developers. But what does the future hold for these small developers? Who are going to be the winners in the next few years? And what does it take to become a legend in an ever more crowded environment? Today, we're going to examine the state of the industry and the prospects for indie developers. We'll look at the breakout genres that define the scene and the overburdened genres that are getting harder to crack. We'll look at the economics of Steam and how rising costs are creating a challenge for smaller developers. We'll look at the ever-present discoverability challenge and how small publishers and promotional events help or fail to help newcomers break out. And after that, we'll break out the old cracked crystal ball and examine the possible futures for the indie sector. But I'm not going at this alone. I had collaborators, more than I had for any other article, in fact. For this one, I surveyed a number of small and solo developers who released a game in 2023. So let's start with an easy question. How are things going overall? The general narrative of the indie game scene has always been one of a fast-growing group of developers running rings around the AAA industry. This is, of course, a narrative built around a very small number of extremely successful titles, often presented by people who, well, spend most of their time talking about AAA games. But what do the actual developers have to say? Well, this is where the narrative gets a little bit complicated. Last year, the consensus from the people I talked to was that things were pretty dismal. But this year, the responses are much more mixed. Last year, Indie Bandits did a survey of independent developers in which nearly two in three said that their game had underperformed their expectations. Now, this doesn't mean that these games necessarily failed, just that the results were disappointing. And in a world where no one talks about indie games unless they sell over a million copies, it could well just be that expectations are too high. Certainly, my own survey suggests this may be the case, as those who responded that they were satisfied with the performance of those games were those with more realistic expectations. For example, Marcus Failer of Fodex Games says, Raidborn did perform better than I would have expected, although my expectations were pessimistic. Speaking of Dredge, Nadia Thorne of Black Salt Games says, It did perform as well as we'd expected, but as the first title from our no-name studio, my expectations were quite low. Even in a tough market, developers aren't necessarily devoid of hope. Yevgeny Orhov of Tall Troll Games says, Definitely we would be happy if the game performed better than it did, but we do understand the reasons behind it, so we take it as a great achievement to release our first game on PC and gather experience along the way. 
Ross Shablisky of D20 Studios says, My launch didn't perform as well as I'd initially aimed for, but at the same time, our game has done exceptionally well for a first-time publication on Steam from an indie developer, and with continued updates to the game and participation in Steam events, the needle is continuing to move. For most of the developers with whom I spoke, the market is getting harder. There has never been a time when more games were released, says Failer. The more competition there is, the harder it gets, especially for small teams and solo developers. Of course, there are also more players than ever, but I feel the high number of competitors outweighs that. So how do developers make their games stand out in such a crowded marketplace? And who have the winners and the losers been over the past year? Inevitably, the story of the indie market is the story of genres, what's trending, what's dying, and what's about to break out. Looking at the success stories for 2023, there are some familiar sights. In particular, games with horror elements remain dominant, with hits such as The Outlast Trials, Barotrauma, Labyrinthine, and Demonologist. Many of these games are built around cooperative multiplayer, and co-op itself was also a big deal. And of course, it would be complete dereliction of duty, not to mention Battlebit Remastered, one of the year's biggest indie hits by far. On the other hand, many traditional genres made triumphant returns due to indie developers. Buoyed by the boomer shooter trend, first-person shooters came back in a big way, with games like Turbo Overkill and Deadlink leading the way. Traditional RPGs and TRPGs made a similar slash, led by titles such as Sea of Stars and Wandering Sword. Surprise hit Pizza Tower shattered the conventional wisdom that old-school platformers can't sell, and sports games, traditionally the domain of the biggest of AAA companies, made some unexpected showings with games like Tape to Tape, Golf It, and Undisputed. But from a developer's perspective, it's never as simple as identifying a trend. The long development cycle of games by small teams means that catching a trend is a matter of luck as much as anything. You might release a game in an emerging, underserved genre, such as Shadows of Doubt, which has benefited from a recent boom in simulationist games. Or you might release a game in a genre that's about to be swallowed up by the AAA companies, as happened to Statera and Bevel Bakery when they released new fighting games right as several storied fighting game franchises drop new titles. And even having a game in a popular genre or subgenre can be a burden. Game Discover Co. featured an article on the underperformance of some recent Metroidvania platformers. Now that's still a popular subgenre, but one that's very top-heavy, meaning that most of the attention falls in a small number of high-profile titles. If you released a game like this in 2023, then you were competing not just against hundreds of similar new games, but also against Hollow Knight, Dead Cells, Bloodstained, Ori, and many, many other well-known titles. And that's just the nature of gaming trends. As recently as two years ago, deck builders were an emerging and highly lucrative type of game. With the market for those games more mature now, it's become very hard to stand out, and the mechanic has become something of an indie cliché. And something similar is happening with the action roguelike, and I have to imagine it won't be long until everyone is sick of seeing games with the word survivors awkwardly stapled to the end of their names. Of course, even within a trendy genre, results are going to vary based on the specific game. Lily Lisboa of Emberfish Games says, Performance is heavily dependent on what each individual game has to offer. That same thought applies to the deck builder and roguelike genres. Players tend to tire of the individual games, but not so much the subgenres. So there's always someone looking for another game that has a strong hook and offers a different or new experience for the genre. I heard something very similar from Enrique Colonet, lead level designer for Blasphemous 2, easily one of the most high-profile Metroidvanias released this year. There is a pretty hardcore audience that loves Metroidvania games, but standing out in this genre is quite hard because said audience is very demanding. If you manage to release an interesting product that convinces players at first, even if it feels incomplete for them, they will not mind waiting for updated content so they have an excuse to play the game again. Adding to this is the complexity of the audience for indie games. A recent survey by Exala points to an interesting set of priorities and preferences among people who buy indie games, especially those who buy and play them the most. They prefer open-ended gameplay, but also want carefully crafted stories. They want to have their skills challenged, but also like to use video games to relax. 
They like the innovative nature of the indie market, but are also nostalgists drawn to games from earlier generations. In short, they are greatly varied in their tastes and are capable of appreciating a wide range of game styles. But that might also be because the people who spend the most money on indie games are also those who spend the most on games, period, including on mainstream AAA titles. Those who are most intense in their love for video games are the same ones who watch the market enough to know about these little promoted smaller games. Perhaps the best play for developers, then, is to not worry too much about genre trends. Julianne of Rundisk says popular genres change very quickly in the world of indie games. In general, if you're trying to get into a trendy genre, it's already too late. So it's a question we don't ask ourselves too much. We think that whatever the type of game, the important thing is the quality that it offers. Something interesting happened on Steam in 2022. According to VG Insights, game sales in the platform declined from 2021 to 2022, 580 million to 535 million, a drop of about 8%. Now this could be attributed to a post-pandemic regression to the mean, except that Steam's revenues did not drop. For every other year, revenue and sales moved together almost perfectly, but in 2022, they made slightly more money on fewer sales. This meant that people spent the same amount of money in order to buy fewer games. It works out to an increase of about 11% per game, or 27% per game since 2018. There are a few possible explanations for this. First, people may be buying more games from double and triple A developers, though other data suggests that this probably isn't the case. Second, people may be buying fewer of the ultra-budget indie games. Third, it may be that the indie games are getting more expensive. Any of these would point to a significant change in the indie market, a change that wouldn't exactly be positive for the development teams. Not everyone agrees with my analysis here, though. Says Shablyski, it is becoming increasingly difficult for indies to create larger scale games and far more profitable to focus on very tiny, low budget games with highly original ideas and highly addictive and replayable gameplay loops that can be developed in six months to a year. In other words, AAA are becoming bigger Death Star type giants and indie need to become increasingly agile X-Wing fighters to remain competitive. The viable market for cruisers and frigates is waning. Silica developer Martin Melicharlik agrees with Shablyski. Long story short, I would actually say that for solo developers in particular, the situation in terms of tools and options available, as well as the market, are relatively favorable, but the mid-sized teams are having a tough time. Both of these takes are consistent with the report put out by VG Insights in July, suggesting that the industry is being hollowed out. The economics are favorable for the world's biggest companies as well as small and solo developers who can operate with minimal overhead, but mid-sized companies suffer from an inability to compete on either price or production values. Indie game prices have progressively decreased over the course of the past decade, with some stores offering games for free on occasion, says Meli Harik. This affects all teams who cannot increase their prices by having to either cut scope, content, or personnel. Motsi of Dratzi Games says, I presume players are usually seeing the price comparisons between games, and if games of similar style are priced in similar ways, it should be expected. The bigger problem overall is actually determining the price the market will bear, and that is a problem regardless of prices increasing over time. Now, anecdotally, the rise in prices does seem to be having an impact on developers, especially when it comes to reviews. I've noticed that people seem to give much more critical reviews to games that are priced at $30 or more. Now that's simply my observation, but it's reasonable to think that people expect more from a game that costs twice what they were expecting. Alexi Giard of Asteroid Lab says, It seems to me the relation to price doesn't have a lot to do with the actual game, but more with how the game is perceived. Thus, if you are a small indie, you'll usually fall on the $20 or under price tag. Some large or great indies might get away with $30, but then people have high expectations on art, content, polish, and depth of the game, and they can be a lot more harsh in their judgment. Anything larger, like $40, is expected to be triple I AAA scope of projects, in my opinion. 
That points to another issue of expectations. Much as developers have certain expectations as to how their games will be received, consumers have expectations as to what they're going to get for the price they pay. And if those prices go up, people are going to expect a lot more. With prices for games, including indie games, outpacing inflation, expectations are bound to rise. Nick Popovich is a founding member of Manami Park, the team behind the multi-million selling Slime Rancher series. What he sees in the future of games is ever-growing competition. The industry is moving towards bigger budgets, longer time frames, and fewer and fewer hidden gems breaking through all the noise, says Popovich. There are over 250 new games added to Steam every week, and that's just Steam. It's very hard for your little game to become a breakout hit just by dropping it on the store and hoping for the best. You need to think big picture about how your game will seep into the consciousness of the public, because 99.9% .9 of the time, it just won't happen. Without question, the number one concern among small developers is growing competition in the market. Now when we talk about competition, we generally mean one of two things. Most commonly, people are referring to quantity, the sheer volume of new titles hitting the market. The PC game boom is not only still going strong, it's actually growing in strength. Steam is on track to see well over 12,000 new games in 2023, as many as were released over the entirety of the Steam Greenlight program. Sklash developer Bastian Bernard says, the current market of games is something that is hard to analyze and understand, and while the AAA games just keep trying to be bigger and bigger and longer and longer with rising and unreasonable production costs, in a world where our time is limited and the number of games infinite, the indie sphere suffers for its non-existent barrier to entry, drowning the chances of a hit game for most developers because of the sheer amount of experiences out there. The other aspect of competition is quality, and that's a little more nebulous. Quality is subjective, but there is data pointing to an increase in quality over time. On Steam, scores for games, both player-generated scores on the platform and Metacritic scores from professional reviewers, have ticked upwards for the past decade. As indie titles have comprised more and more of the Steam catalog, as much as 99% by some estimates, people have found those games to be overall better. Now from a consumer standpoint, this is all upside. Everyone wants a better game, and the typical game is a lot better now than it was during the mid-2010s when the indie market was crushed under layer after layer of cheap asset flips. But to a developer, this means a higher bar to clear. It means that the kind of rough but quirky game that could catch someone's eye back in 2015 might be completely lost today. Josh Holleran of Critical Games says, as some indie games and AA developers aim for higher and higher production values, it may become increasingly difficult for small indies with meager budgets to keep up with player expectations. I've spoken to multiple indie developers who are worried about this. And I've heard about this from several people myself. With some smaller studios now producing games that come very close to AAA quality, there's now an arms race among indie developers to make their games flashy enough to draw attention. That requires money, and these days there are fewer and fewer sources of ready cash. Which isn't to say that the small developer is beyond hope. There is one source of funding that only seems to be growing. Over time, the definition of indie game has become more and more nebulous. When 99% of new games can be classified as indies, the term becomes more of a supercategory that encompasses many different titles, teams, philosophies, and experiences. And nowhere is this more clear than with the emergence of the indie publisher. On Steam, a publisher is not strictly necessary. Anyone with the modest sum necessary to submit can see their game put on sale. However, working with a publisher offers many advantages, including marketing, something that most small teams lack entirely, greater contact with the press, more development resources, and better odds of landing on consoles. Of course, this comes at a cost of a smaller cut of the profits and less creative control overall. So, is it worth it? Well, it's not a question with an easy answer. Per VG Insights, there are advantages to partnering with what they call an indie publisher. 
which includes companies such as Team17, Tiny Build, Daedalic, Humble Games, and Playway. Games released through these publishers score about 6% better on Steam and are around 12% more likely to generate in excess of $5,000 in revenue. Those are small benefits, but in a crowded marketplace, they may count for a lot. However, those benefits pale in comparison to what a developer gets by publishing through a AA publisher, something like Devolver, Gearbox, Coffee Stain, or Deep Silver. Games published through these comparatively prestigious outfits enjoy Steam scores that are 17% higher than the average self-published game and are 48% more likely to make in excess of $5,000. Of course, since games released through publishers still have to be accepted, we encounter a bit of a causality issue. In other words, do these games do better because they had the resources of a publisher? Or do publishers select games that are more likely to do well? Motsi says, My general inquiries about publishing studios leads me to believe that their overall influence, indie or otherwise, isn't great unless there's some huge success they can hang their hat on. There's just too many different names out there for any individual studio to be well known in general. In my opinion, as a developer, I think studios should focus on the success of their games instead of their overall influence on the industry. The influence would follow the success, and it's already hard enough to make a game successful in this competitive market. Martin Melicharek has a different take. Very large studios are best situated to continue focusing on their strong IPs, while indie developers are likely safest partnering with publishers that are able to secure promotion and funding for their games. In a very real sense, it feels like a mild return to the 90s era, with publishers playing a pivotal role in the release of games while smaller teams develop them. Enrique Colonet adds, As we see some small indie developers growing and reaching an admirable financial status with their games, it happens that sometimes they want to venture into publishing, especially to avoid certain abuses or mistakes they committed when working with publishers for the first time. I really like the idea of an indie publisher helping an indie developer because it is a relation that has been born out of mutual understanding. The main benefit to working with a publisher might be mitigation of risk. While games in conventional or popular genres can realize modest benefits from using a publisher, it's the more experimental or emergent games that have the most to gain. Without a built-in audience, the added marketing push can give these games far greater reach than they would have on their own. Cole Jeffries of Coal Powered Games says, I believe publishers at this level should be pushing to support unique and groundbreaking games, i.e. games larger publishers see as too risky or unproven. Finding these niches will be the key to their success, but it also comes with risk. If there's one thing that creative people in general are completely sick of, it's talk about promotion. When everyone is in competition with the entire world, being good or even great might not be enough to stand out. And the video game market is certainly no exception. The Indie Bandit survey revealed that a lot of developers don't have any meaningful plan to promote their games. A surprising number, nearly 2 in 5, don't even have a website. And as someone who has reviewed a lot of indie games, I can tell you that even when a developer has a website, some of them don't have an email address or contact form on that site. As I tell people, always act as though there are media types who are interested in your work, even if you're convinced there is no interest. Of course, a lack of contact information wasn't an issue for the people who answered my survey. For people who are more serious about game development, the next step is finding those interested parties. And when it comes to getting that kind of exposure, one name keeps coming up over and over again. Steam Next Fest. Steam Next Fest is the single most useful marketing event we had, said Nadia Thorne. We shouldn't have taken down our demo after Next Fest. Our pre-release wishlist, just general visibility of Dredge tanked when we took the demo down and no longer had streamers and YouTubers picking up the game. We thought our game wouldn't be good for streaming, and we were wrong. The Next Fest events have absolutely exploded in recent years. Over 11 million people viewed the June 2023 Next Fest, a record for the event. Developers have a lot to gain from landing a place in Next Fest, including thousands of new followers, wishlist placements, and demo downloads. 
that's a lot of exposure for small and solo developers who may have no other means of getting noticed. Steam Next Fest remains one of, if not the most important promotional tools for indie developers, but these digital showcases have expanded far beyond these three yearly events. They are now genre-specific showcases, publisher showcases, and a range of mini-exhibitions hosted by various third-party groups. Steam showcases have become nearly constant, with few weeks that don't have at least one such event. Personally, these events have become the primary means by which I find upcoming games for reviews. But like Steam itself, NextFest is growing ever more crowded. Alexi Giard says, In the past year or two, I feel that Steam Next Fests, which were originally to help promote small indie games, have become more and more a platform for triple I games which completely take the podium nowadays. What used to be a great opportunity to get wish lists in a community has become a lot tougher. Now, as valuable as it is, Steam Next Fest isn't the be all end all for promotion. Curation and aggregation are an increasingly vital means of getting noticed. A developer who gets a game featured on an indie-focused aggregator can get a big boost in visibility, even if the account is relatively small. Having someone present your title directly to a hungry audience is a fantastic way to break out from the crowd. But for many small developers, the greatest potential source for promotion lies in the people who purchase and play the games, and especially those who leave reviews. Josh Holleran says, if you really like a game and want to support the developer, then please consider sharing your opinions with friends or on social media. Word of mouth is an indie's greatest ally. Leaving reviews on websites like Steam also makes a giant difference. The global media market is in a state of flux right now, and the video game industry in particular is far from mature. This means lots of new opportunities for anyone willing to take a risk, and it's often smaller developers and publishers who are most eager to take those risks. Subscription services are a major opportunity for the smaller developer. The Xbox Game Pass has been one of Microsoft's more popular feature for the past few years, popular enough to spur other companies to introduce their own services to promote their in-house games. While these services are still sold primarily on the basis of their big-time AAA hits, they also offer more humble companies a chance to have their games seen. And as a bonus, the developer doesn't have to sweat out the details over price points. Ross Shiblyski says, Speaking as a consumer of games, these packages are becoming more and more compelling as they acquire high-quality Indian AAA games, to the point where it almost seems foolish to invest in direct game purchases when you can get a treasure trove of new games to play for the cost of buying a couple AAA games. Assuming these service providers can continue to maintain high-quality catalogs, I think this creates a lot of pressure for indies to either seek deals with these services and or try and create something that can stand out as either a must-play game or a service-based game that can maintain a fan base for a long time. That last point offers another option for the aspiring game developer. In recent years, many mid-sized development companies, such as Paradox Interactive, have shifted to a live-service light model built around DLC, a move that has been highly profitable. Last year's Surprise Cuphead DLC, dropped five years after the base game's release, was a big enough success for Studio MDHR that it suggests that this approach could work for smaller developers as well. With the market growing faster by the year, sustaining older games for longer might be the key. But the biggest obstacles for small teams have always been access and audience, and here things are changing as well. Aldrich Chong of Spiral Up Games says, Game engines are becoming more user-friendly, leveling the playing field for indie developers. Also, the rise of cross-platform gaming, including cloud gaming, will open new avenues and potentially larger audiences for indie titles. There is still one thing to consider. As much time as we spend talking about platforms, technology, promotional tools, and money, the thing that exerts the most gravity on the indie game scene is the rest of the industry. Small developers are at their weakest when the AAA developers are at their strongest. And while those major companies are still the kings of the industry, they are ripe to be deposed. At the beginning of this piece, I said that the gaming press view indie games through a David vs. Goliath lens that isn't really true. 
But what if that view, however inaccurate it may be, is the biggest upside of all? John Baez is the president of The Behemoth, one of the early success stories in indie, and still responsible for some of the best-selling indie titles ever. Much of what he said echoed what I heard from other developers and publishers, but there was one thing that stood out. I think solo and small team devs can make it in the current conditions, and the press always loves the solo dev narrative, and rightly so. Solo devs should never doubt their work unless they are just doing derivative ideas without any originality. Every small developer's ace in the hole is that everyone wants them to succeed. The industry as a whole is in a very bad place, burdened by years of scandal, controversy, and ruinous press. We celebrate when a big company has a setback and rejoice when a newcomer triumphs. And in such an environment, the best thing that any developer can do is resist the urge to imitate those big developers and stick to their own strengths. Put simply, the tragic state of AAA development has created an opening for something new to take its place. And who knows? 2024 is looking to be a big year, and it could well be a turning point. It is a fool who makes hard predictions, but sometimes the temptation, just too great. As with previous years, I now take a stab at foreseeing what's to come over the next few years. No promises are made, and no refunds will be offered. 1. Tools employing so-called artificial intelligence will result in a flood of shovelware titles comparable to what we saw after the launch of the Unity Asset Store. What impact this will have is going to depend on how, in particular, Steam reacts to it, and of course, they have a history of handling such issues badly. 2. While open world and other thousand hour games will continue to dominate the sales charts, there will be an increasing demand for more conventional titles, things that appeal to the nostalgia of an aging game playing population. More experimental games will be on the sidelines, at least for now. 3. As the industry continues to spread, a wider variety of countries will be represented among the ranks of the significant developers. In particular, we will see notable releases from upstart African and Latin American developers as those markets continue to mature. 4. With some AAA developers having great success with relatively small games, we will see an increase in the number of small team titles published by large companies, further blurring the line between the core of the industry and the indie scene. 5. As we continue to leave the age of the Kingmaker influencer behind us, we'll see an increase in the importance of smaller, more niche curators and websites. Most developers will have better luck working with people who specialize in their subgenres than they will with the more mass market sources. 6. Meanwhile, the larger personalities will continue to use the platonic ideal of indie gaming as a bludgeon in their campaign to badmouth AAA companies while failing to promote any but the absolute biggest of indie games. And yes, I know, this one's a gimme, but please, please somebody prove me wrong. So what does 2024 really have in store for the indie game community? Well, I suppose we'll just have to find out together.